Hi, I'm Cappy from Always in Stitches in Noblesville, Indiana. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, you've already found the fun, exciting things that we offer. Uh, several, over 100 videos last I counted. And lots of things to learn. But this morning, what I'm gonna teach you is how to make a little pin cushion, um, an English paper piece pin cushion that's just kind of like this. Just a nice little quick, easy project. It's a great way to get introduced into English paper piecing. And um, I hope you'll enjoy it. But before we get to making this, I wanna teach you some of the things you need to know about English paper piecing. So we have a kit you can buy in our store. And in that kit are some fun things that you're gonna need. First of all, there's a template to cut your fabric. There's the little paper templates to wrap your fabric around. There's a glue pen, which we can talk, we're gonna talk about gluing or basting. There's some needles, gotta have some needles. There's a magnet, which we're gonna to use to hold our fabric together. There's a spool of thread. Um, and there's a package of um, the walnut shells and some fabric and an ink pen. There's also my business card and a little instruction sheet that tells you a little bit about English paper piecing to kind of help you get along the way. So this gets you started. And now I'm gonna go through each of these items and explain to you why you need them and what's gonna happen with English paper piecing. <clears throat> so when you do English paper piecing, there's, uh, there's Sue Daly, who is kind of the queen of English paper piecing, and Tula Pink, who also is a, a really amazing paper piecer. Um, and they both have kind of different opinions on thread, and I have my own opinion on thread. So at the end of the day, you gotta use what works for you. But what I like to use is Aurafil thread. It's an 80 weight thread. Um, Tula uses a 50 weight Aurafil, and Sue Daly uses the, a polyester lingerie weight thread. Um, this is an Aurafil 80 weight thread in cotton. I'm of the opinion I like to use cotton thread with cotton fabrics, just my thing. Not everybody feels that way, but I do. Um, this is a very fine weight thread. It's, a, a, it's, it's very light, it's like a, almost like a like hair. I mean, it's very, very, very thin. But you want that in order for your stitches to not show when you're doing English paper piecing. The other thing I want you to know about thread is there is a top and a bottom. So uh, the top of the thread is, if Jeff can come in close, he's, we got Jeff behind the camera this morning. You can see the word Aurafil on the top of the spool. And where that says Aurafil, that's the top of the spool of thread. So when I pull my thread off, I wanna come up off the top of the thread and I don't wanna get much longer than about from my fingertip to my elbow. That's plenty of thread. I don't really need more thread than that. Um, <clears throat> if, if you think about how many times this piece of thread is gonna go through your fabric, unlike with a sewing machine where it goes in once, makes a stitch and it's finished. With this, we're gonna repetitively run that thread through the fabric. So I want my thread going the right direction and that has to do with the twist of the thread. If I go the opposite direction, it causes the thread to fluff. So I wanna go from top to bottom on my thread and I'm gonna have a little tail that leaves me enough of a tail. The tail is gonna be discarded because if you think of for going top to bottom, the tail is always backwards. So that piece of the thread is nasty. Um, but this piece of the thread is the one I'm gonna sew with. And then I have a thing, and this isn't in your kit because we tried to make the kit affordable to get started. But one of the things I really truly believe in is a thread conditioner. Um, this is basically just beeswax. I can remember my mom having one of these when I was a kid and I was fascinated by it. Um, but it, it is quite simply beeswax. There are other thread conditioners out there. Whatever one you like is fine. But I'm gonna run my thread, being sure to keep track of where the top is, through this thread conditioner, and it, it doesn't leave a residue on my fabric or anything, but it really helps my thread pass through my fabric in a way that it doesn't get uh, tangled as much. So I've been able to keep track of which was the top, and when I thread my needle, I'm gonna be sure I thread it through the top. Now when I'm threading these needles, now we're gonna talk about the needle. <clears throat> what you have in your kit is called a milliner or a straw needle. I don't know, Jeff, if you can get up on that, if it's showing, but it says milliner or straw, which is the same thing. Basically what this is, is a very long, and I'm gonna have Jeff get up close. It's a very long, I mean, look how long that needle is. See how long it is? 
Um, let me find a standard quilting needle or a shorter quilting needle. See, this is, see, there's typically what you're quilting with. <laughs> so it's a good, gosh, almost half inch longer. The other thing about a, a straw or a milliner needle is the eye of the needle is the same size as the needle. So that's another reason why I want to use a very lightweight thread. You know, to shove a 50 weight thread through the eye of a milliner needle can be tough. So I like to use the thinner thread. Milliner needles come 9, 10, 11 in the size of them. That's the diameter of the needle. I use a 9 because I tend to be a little heavy handed. Um, let me show you this needle. It, I don't know if it shows on the, on the screen, but it's bent. I have used that needle so much that I have been caused it to bend. That needle needs to be discarded. Um, if if you're not a heavy hand, you might be able to do an 11 or a 10, but I tend to really push hard and so I bend my needles. So I, I go with a nine because it's a little thicker. Um, but uh, in any case, I, I like a nine. That's my, that's my thing. Um, so that one went in the trash, bye bye needle. Um, and so then I'm gonna thread my needle, but I'm not gonna tie a knot in the end of the thread because I'm gonna show you in a little bit a trick on how to do that. Now, threading a number nine milliner needle is an adventure. I'm just gonna tell you uh, right now, getting through the eye of that needle can be a trick. And look, I did it on the first one. It must be the luck of being on the camera. Um, ha have a nice sharp edge. If you're having trouble threading it, take your scissors and cut another, uh, cut the end of the thread again and even kind of at a little angle if you can, because sometimes that helps it get in. But um, there's your needle all threaded and ready to go. Um, as far as color of your thread, I included in your kit is a funny little color called Moonstone, I think, which is kind of a gray beige color. You can use any color thread. Um, you can match the project you're working on. The problem is if you look at this piece over here, Jeff, I'm gonna scan in on this. When I'm putting a, a light piece next to a dark piece, it's hard to know which color thread to use. Typically the lighter thread is the better choice than the darker thread when you're going from light to dark. But when you use just a grayish like this, it doesn't matter, it blends either way. So I buy a lot of this kind of, it's a moonstone is the color. This one's also, I don't know, this one's color 5011. Just kind of that grayish is nice. In a perfect world, your stitches aren't gonna show. That's the goal. But uh, but this is a good basic, funny kind of beige, grayish color. So that's your thread. We've threaded our needle. <clears throat> now let's talk about templates and the paper. So there's lots of ways to uh, cut your pieces that you're gonna baste or glue around. I love my templates. This happens to be a two, from a Tula kit but it's still, it's a one inch hexi, which is kind of your basic, this is a, a one inch hexi, and one inch is the measurement from here to here is one inch. So when you're looking at a template, that's the piece that you're, that's what you're measuring is your one inch. This isn't one inch, this is like two inches, I think, but this is one inch on each side. Um, my templates, which I can buy for just about any paper that you can buy, you can also buy an acrylic template can be a 3 8 inch seam, which means it's gonna go out 3 8 of an inch from here, or a quarter of an inch seam. I would suggest the 3 8 inch seam. I like the 3 8 inch seam because it gives me enough to roll around the paper and glue. Um, it's not that much more than a quarter. I mean, it, it just works better. Um, if, if you're really good at it, you may want a quarter inch. Some people are all about the quarter inch. I think 3 8 is plenty, um, but basically, when I buy a template, it's gonna tell me what size hexi it makes. So this is a one inch template, even though this dimension out here is not one inch, they're talking about the inside dimension of the actual paper template is one inch. That's a little confusing, but um, be sure you get templates to match your papers. Now, you don't even have to buy templates. You can just use the papers, add a quarter or three eighths of an inch and trace around them and use those and not have to buy the acrylic templates. The kicker is most patterns anymore come with, and like right now I'm working on what's called bloomers, comes with an acrylic template set. So this is all the pieces that are in the particular quilt that goes with this pattern. This is a set of templates. The templates are 20 bucks. 
it's worth your investment, truly, to buy these templates. The other thing that comes when you buy these templates is what I call a bag of papers. Now this is from Ella Flory. This is another, another one I'm gonna do, God willing, someday. But these are all the paper templates to do Mella Flory, and the acrylic templates are in here too. Of course, they're clear, so you can't even see them. <clears throat> but when you buy, most patterns that you buy are going to have the paper templates and the acrylic templates available. Look how tiny those are. I think I might be crazy if I do this. Are those even showing up, Jeff? Okay, he's shaking his head. Y'all can't hear him. But, but there's my acrylic templates that go with the paper set. If you buy a pattern, that's what you're going to get. And it's, it is nice. Um, the paper templates are kind of out of a, a, a cardstock weight fabric. I've heard paper or paper. I've heard a lot of people will cut their own templates. Go for it. I can buy a hundred of these templates for five bucks. I need to be less than that. Might even be four bucks. And I can use this same paper template like 20 times for what it costs for me to buy a pre-made paper template, I am not going <laughs> to cut them out. It just sounds like a big headache to me. Now, if you've got a Cricut or one of those scan and cut things, you might be able to just like pop them out. And that's cool if that makes you happy. But there isn't a template, acrylic template out there that you can't buy a paper template to go with. Go this way, it's easier, it's, it's practical. You know they're accurate, you know it's gonna work. So there you go, there's your template story. The other thing is your glue stick. <clears throat> um, this one is made by the Sew Line Company, and I love my little Sew Line glue stick. I use my Sew Line glue stick for lots and lots and lots and lots of things. Um, and you can see it's kind of snarly because I've been, I've been using her. She's got snot around her nose. It's nasty. I apologize. Um, but this has a little piece of glue in the top, and it just rolls up. You know, gets bigger as it needs to and as I use it. It has refills that you just refill it. Super simple, super easy. I love ba glue basting my uh, templates more than than sewing them. The, the old school was you did just sew around all the corners and that basted it in place. It absolutely works. If you want to do it that way, that's okay. But I think this, it's sort of the kindergarten thing. I really like the glue stick. I just like to play with it. Um, I have seen where people are using like the Elmer school glue little sticks. You can't, and they're like, oh, they're so much less expensive. I suppose they are, but at the end of the day, this glue is formulated to be used on fabric. And when it um, dries, it doesn't gunk up the fabric. It doesn't gunk up your needle. Um, it comes the right width. The, the school glues are really thick and they're too big. So I really would recommend this product. Um, and I can tell you, I use this all the time when I'm putting zippers in, it's a nice little glue base to hold a zipper in place to the fabric. And just, I can't tell you how many times I grab my glue stick. I, I think I've got two or three of them as a matter of fact, just because they're so handy. So, um, anyway, that's your glue stick and that's, and I'll show you how you're going to use it here in just a second. Um, this is walnut shelf. This is just crushed walnut shells. We buy the, I buy it, you can buy it at the pet store if you find the right pet store in a, like a huge bag. You only need four ounces for this. Um, but, and we sell this in the store, but you can buy a great big bag of it at the pet store for like hardly anything. Um, and that's a good deal. All right. I think I've talked, oh, the magnet, the magnet, didn't talk about the magnet. Um, so this is a little magnet that holds your pieces together. And this is a dream. We put one in each of your kits. I actually have like a whole set of magnets. I mean, I have way more magnets than I will ever use because they came in big bundles. But I used to use binder clips. So when you sew two pieces together, so I'm going to show you a couple hexagons. Come on here close, Jeff. <clears throat> so here's a couple hexagons that I've cut and I've glued and they're ready to go. When I'm ready to sew them together, I need to put these two sides together. And I used to use a binder clip because, you know, these were like the best thing ever. And so I would put my binder clip. Well, what happens when I take my thread around is my thread would get trapped on that binder clip. And I was just like, ugh. But you'd need something to hold your pieces together just to help your hands relax a little bit. So ta-da, here comes the magnet. Now, my husband got hearing aids. He's the one running the TV or the video. And when he got hearing aids, he was like, what is that clacking noise? <laughs> these, 
magnets are so strong, they could probably hold a family of six together forever because they're really heavy. And they kind of, you got to really pull on them to get them apart and together. But when you put your two pieces together now with the magnet, now when I sew, I have, I don't get caught. So that's why the magnets are a plus. Um, so we give you a magnet so that you can play with it and see how it works. So that's your contents. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about fabric choices now. Um, with your kits, we've included a, a, a fat quarter just because it's more than enough to make what you need. But when you're looking and auditioning fabric for English paper piecing, what makes English paper piecing so much fun is if you think of your fabric as your paint and your needle and thread is like your paintbrush, because I can do some really cool layouts and I'm going to go to some big pieces here so you can see a little better. So if, if you know, like this little piece on this little pin cushion, they're just little hexagons and they're just random and there's no pattern to them and it's still stinking cute. I don't, I don't care what you say. That's cute. But, with English paper piecing, I can pick particular motifs and create designs. For instance, if I would do this, now I'm not sewing them together this way, but look at the secondary design that you get because of the way I cut that out against the hexagon. And so Jeff, scan over to this so we can look at it. Here's that exact piece. See, I put these two pieces together and they mirror each other. Um, it makes it really fun. Um, the other thing, like in this particular quilt, when you look at these little faces, I cut all the faces the same way. And the stars have the same line going the same direction. So when, one of the things that makes English, English paper piecing so much fun is the way the fabrics create a design and they really become your paint. They become this ability to design things in ways that are super, super cool. So um, let me show you this. Okay, let's look at this. This is for bloomers. It's what's called bloomers is the name of the pattern. But look how I took in these trumpets. Here's this piece right here. That's this one here. And see the trumpet design? See how that trumpet repeats? And in the center is a little floral. And then these little stripes do some fun things. Same goes up here. Look at this piece. See how these stripes go out to make a design and there's a center floral and then all these little pieces come together. So repetitive fabric or patterns that have a distinct um, repetition in the way that they're printed, like this piece of fabric, which has very specific repetitive patterns, chop up really nicely. For instance, this is one of the things I cut out of that black and white piece I just showed you. Look at these little pieces when you put them together. Now, I cut them to do the pin cushion and I made a mistake. And let me show you what happens. So I put the point right here on the hexagon. Well, when you sew it to another hexagon, it doesn't do quite the coolest thing. I mean, it's okay. It's not, I'm not going to complain about it. Right? Somebody handed this to me and gave it to me. I would say, you are wonderful. What a great gift because I'm not into quilt shaming. I'm into quilt loving. So this is cool. But let me show you what happens when I take this out and I put these three pieces together. Look at the secondary design I get now. Isn't that much cooler? I mean, you get this really cool swirl. And then I could go out again. Actually, I'd probably go this way. So this is why hexagons are so fun to play with, especially when you start working with designs. Um, you, you can really cut out and make some cool things. So the fat quarter included in your kit may be one that you can do some fun um, fussy cutting, so to speak, to create a design, or it may just be a solid or just a kind of a basic print. You might look at the one you're cutting to figure out if it's got something fun you can do in it. Um, but it's, the, the point of this project is just to learn how to do it. I'm not trying to teach you um, all the aspects of fabric design and layout, because that's the whole color and size and large, medium, small, light, medium, dark, all that kind of stuff. That's a whole nother class. But, but for what we're doing, um, you can add those elements and make a big difference in how your, how your pin cushion turns out. So I've got some 
cut here and I'm going to show you now the beginning process. We've kind of talked about the details that you need to know. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how I cut these fabrics. So you'll see here I've done a repetitive design and as you can see I've picked out this little heart and I've cut all my pieces the same way so that my heart's going to come together and it's going to do something fun. So we're going to do something like this. It's going to come together like that. See how they're all going the same direction. And then this is going to be my top and that's going to be my bottom. Now, again, they can all be the same, it doesn't matter, but the fun part of English paper piecing is make this work. So how do I get those designs to come out exactly right on this template and this paperwork? That's, that's the trick. So Jeff's gonna have to walk around here, get a little closer to me. And there's a couple tools that we have that are really, really helpful. So this one, let's slide the chair over. So this one is a light board. Um, I'll turn it off so you can see it get dark. This I love when I'm working with fabrics because I can see the fabric. So if I'm trying to cut, you'll be able to see where I've previously cut out these pieces. If I'm trying to cut, and that is exactly this piece right here. If I'm trying to cut that piece, this light board helps make that happen. So there's a couple things I can do. If I was cutting this exact piece, I can take and do what I call registration marks on a paper one, and I can make little marks to help me find, if I don't have templates and I wanna just use paper, I can set this on here and I can make a line like, there's that, there's that, here's the heart, here's the bird, Here's the bird. And now next time I lay that on another piece. Now, if I was gonna cut that, I would just add a little bit on each side and just go around it. And that's the other thing. I'm using a small rotary cutter because it's easier to do these cuts with a small rotary cutter than the big standard 45 millimeter. So I'm just gonna cut around my paper. The same thing is true of the template. When I put the template on, it has these same lines and now I can look back, and if I've got this registration, I can see that this goes here. I'm putting the neck there and there. I'm putting this point, this point on that one. I'm going to put this point on that one. This much is hanging over. This much is hanging over. So see how I'm using my template as a registration of where I want to cut. And because this light board has this plastic mat on it that's a cutting mat, I can cut right on it. So I just go like this, oops, well, you gotta have the blade open. I just cut like this, and like that, and like that, and like that. I'm trying to make it so you can see, so it's feeling a little awkward. And boom, I have my piece right there. So now I have my little piece that when I wrap it around my template, it's going to be just like I want it. And so now I can repeat that again and again and again. So when I have a repetitive pattern, this is pretty important to me. Um, the light board. I, and I use this light board for all kinds of stuff. I've been amazed how many opportunities I've had to use this light board. It's not an inexpensive investment, um, but worth the money. So the other thing that I like to be able to do, I'm going to put it down here out of the way, is if I'm working with solid colors, or things that don't maybe require to be so specific. Let's get some light on this. Can you see that okay, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the other thing I can do, if I'm coloring, if I'm doing solid color hexagons, now I can cut two or three layers. So let's say I want four of these green hexagons. I can come into the corner of this. Now this is a rotating mat, and I love my rotating mat too. I have a small one and I have a big one. Um, but again, I'm going to just cut, and I'm doing, I'm doing like four hexagons at this point. And see, look how that just turns. And then I can cut, and I can cut, I can cut. She slid on me, and I can cut. And I've got four hexagons just like that. So if I'm not working with a specific pattern where I have to fussy cut and look at the background and make sure everybody matches, I'm probably 
going to be using this because I just can randomly cut chunks after chunk after chunk. So just a couple tools that are real helpful um, when you're working with the different pieces that you work with. So that mat, rotating mat, and this is not in your kit, but it's something to think about. All right, let's go glue because, you know, it's all about the glue. I was not a glue eater in kindergarten. I just want to know, I want you to know, even though I'm talking about glue with so much affection, I didn't eat glue, but <laughs> there was one. There's always one in every class, right? That's like the glue eater. And this is like a popsicle, man. I mean, if you're a glue eater, this is like a perfect, you know, roll it up, eat a little more. No, not suggesting that. Just trying to keep you laughing and awake in what I'm doing here. Okay, so this is going to be my pin cushion. And these are my pieces that I cut. Now, I can just draw around. I didn't really say that. I can. This is why we put the ink pen in there. I can always just draw around a template. So, for instance, if I was working with this, I can also just, you know, take my fabric, draw my lines. Let's go up here. I'm going to have lots of green. I'm going to have to make something for, for Dawn Cornell. She loves green. Um, I can draw my lines like this. And then I can just take my, my nice scissors. And I can just cut. I don't have to use a rotary cutter. Because these pieces get folded under, they don't have to be exactly perfect. And this, I think this is the difference between uh, where you sew machine, machine sew fabric together or you hand piece. You know, I got a lot of fudge to work with here as far as making it work. See, boom, I cut four more. I'm going to be making something green. Just don't get around it. But there, so there's four more. And I did it with my scissors. So, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and there's more than one way to make a quilt. All right. So there you go. I've shown you all the ways you can cut fabric, and you probably come up with some more. So here's now I'm ready to glue. So what I I've just got this laid out just so you can visually see. You know, I might turn these other ways. I don't know. Who knows what I'll how I'll turn it? But right now, what I like is seeing these pieces come together. You know, is the secondary design that it creates. So to glue my fabric, it's a very simple process. I'm gonna flip this over. And you can put a little dot in the center to kind of make sure it stays where you put it. But I wanna line up my points because especially with this one, I've been very specific about how I cut it out. So I wanna be sure that I don't like get it too far that way or too far this way. And then it doesn't give me the, the design that I want. So I'm gonna put a little dot there. That just kind of helps make sure, yeah, I got everybody in the right place. And then when I'm gluing, I don't wanna glue like gobby glue. I don't want this to be like so much glue that I can't even uh, work with it. it. It doesn't take very much of this glue. It's another reason I like this glue stick. I wanna go just a lot, and I do this so quickly anymore, I don't really think about it. So this is, I gotta slow down and think about what I'm showing you. Um, Typically, I kind of go, I go up just a little bit to catch the fabric. I go across here and see there's a little glob right there. I need to put a little glob right there. It's okay. I don't care. She'll, she'll soak it up. So I go across here. And if you notice, I've left, uh, it's probably close to a 16th of an inch, but I, I want to leave about an eighth of an inch between the edge of the cardboard and before my glue starts, because I want a, almost like a little fabric bubble to create right in there. So I'm gonna go up here, across, and I go up here. So I'm making a U. And then I just fold that over. And I kind of, I press it tight. Now, I didn't pre-wash my fabric. I didn't iron my fabric. My fabric um, is gonna stabilize because of wrapping it around this paper. That's another reason that's a good reason to do it. It wraps around the paper. If, you, if you're being very specific about your fabric design, it might be smart to starch and spray because you, you don't want any shift in that at all. That's probably, but most of the time you can fudge it and make it work. But um, potentially if you're making very specific designs that have to match together, I might spray starch my fabric just a little bit to kind of help hold it. But it's not huge. For the most part, if there, there's like some... I, I typically don't, and it's okay. Okay, so I've done that side. Now I'm gonna come, and I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna do a, a slash there, 
a slice here and a slice here. So I'm kind of making a U and I fold that over and I'm gonna be real careful to be sure that this point here is nice, nicely creased, okay? I don't want that to be sloppy. I want that to be tight because I want, because these paper templates make every piece exactly the right size, it's real important that that point be, be, be tight and not sloppy. I don't know how else to say that, but that's the way we're saying it. So then I'm gonna do another U. And so here's the fun part. I, I do this in, in, in uh, kind of portions. I'll cut for a while and then I'll glue for a while. Then I'll cut for a while and then I'll glue for a while. And, and what's nice about it is it's very transportable. Um, so see, we're just kind of going around and I honestly, I do this so fast anymore. I don't even think about the process, but I just want that nice and tight around that piece. And then the very last one, same thing. I'm just going to glue. And sometimes I put a little extra dot there because that, that piece of fabric doesn't have much paper to connect with on a hexi. So there we go. Okay. So there's my hexi. She's ready to go. And I'll do that with all these pieces. Um, solids, same thing. It doesn't change anything. I don't have to be quite so antsy about getting it exactly in the center. So I typically don't put a dot there. Again, if I'm not matching specific patterns, I'm just going to do this. And I can just show you. This is like speed, speed pasting. I'm just going to snap this around. I do like to have a surface that I can work against. This is a little soft. I'm working on my Martelli. Um, mats a little I like a little something a little firmer typically underneath it but my tabletop is white and I didn't know how well it would show so there we go I see what I'm not talking about look how quick I do that and there she is okay so that's how you make your hexes um, and this is why quilters don't get rid of fabric because <laughs> we got basically a two and a half inch square here which that's another thing if you buy those little mini charms they make one inch hexes perfect. So you can buy a pack of mini charms, those two and a half inch squares, and you can get 40 hexes out of it because you don't have to cut much off of them and they fold nice. So it's a great use for those if you've got those mini charms hanging around um, to make hexes out of. So that's how I make my hexes. So now I'm ready to sew things together. So I'm gonna lay it out just like I did, and I'm just gonna, these are kind of randomness, but it'll give you the sense. I'm gonna take my, now I'm using a contrasting center color just because it's easier to teach and show you what to use. So I'm gonna lay my hexes around it. And, and this one, I'm gonna watch the pattern. Now I already showed you, this would be much cuter if they were like that, but let's say we had to use them like this. We'll just do that and that. And I'm gonna lay this down somewhere the way that I wanna sew it together. If they're just random and they don't have a pattern, it doesn't make any difference how you sew them together. But if I want a pattern, it's going to be real critical to what I do to sewing them together. So I'm going to lay this down so I know which one goes to which. But this is what you're going to make. When you make your one for this, you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one for the bottom. So when you look at this, that's where I've got two, two, a top and a bottom, and then the six for a round. That's why you should have eight, eight papers in your package. So that's, that's your pattern. So then I'm going to start sewing these together. And this is where my little um, magnet, <laughs> brain fade, magnet comes together. So when I lay this down, I want to be sure I get things right. What I'm going to sew together first is I'm going to sew all of these onto the center. Okay. There's lots of ways you can do this. I've made this pin cushion 15 times and, and this pattern works for me. You can do it however you want, but I like to sew all these onto my center top first. So I pick up this one and I lay it down and I make sure I remember which side I'm sewing to which side and I fold them together and I kind of make sure, and it should if I've done good gluing and done paint, good, come on close Jeff so they can see. If I've done good gluing and good turning of my points, these are gonna match exactly. If they don't, I'm gonna kind of squeeze a little back and forth, you know, like you do when you have that quarter inch, maybe that's not quite perfect, kind of split the difference. And then I'm going to clamp my magnet on here. And I'm going to remember that this is the side I want to sew. 
because I, the very first one, it's really easy to sew the wrong one. And let me show you what happens when you do that. Look at this one right here. So I, I did around, around, around. See, they're all pointing, pointing, pointing. <clears throat> right there. I'm gonna have to rip that one off, which well, I'll show you how to do that. But this one's right. And then I'll have another one that goes in here to make my other pin cushion. But see what happens? I, I just didn't sew it on right. I sewed it the wrong direction. So that's why it's kind of nice to start with something that's not directional. But So now to sew my two hexes together, I have my number nine milliner needle and I have my 80 weight aura fill moonstruck thread. And I do not have a knot in the end. Now I'm gonna teach you how to do what's called a knotty knot. I call it a knotty knot. Sue Daly calls it a knicker knot. I don't even know if Tula does it, but I love this knot because it doesn't leave a knot. It's very flat, it's very smooth. Um, it's called a lingerie knot because I think they used it to make lingerie. And because Sue Daly is British, Australian accent kind of person, I think she's actually Australian, sorry. Um, she calls it a knicker knot. And watch her videos because she just is stitched to watch. She's so much fun. So I, it's not got a knot in the end. And I'm gonna start on a point and I gotta peek again and make sure I'm going the right direction. Okay, we're okay. So <clears throat> I'm going to, my stitches need to be, because this particular project is gonna have this really sandy like walnut shells in it, I want my stitches a little closer together than I would typically do. Um, I usually go between a 16th at the most an eighth apart but I'm gonna put these really close because I don't want my my uh, stuff to slide out between the cracks. But to start my stitching, I go and I catch just the corner of the thread. And Jeff, I don't know if you can see this, but I have basically just about two threads from the pink and about two threads from the black, and I'm right on the point. I'm just right on the point. And I'm going exactly perpendicular to both pieces of fabric. So I'm not at an angle. I'm not going an angle this way. I'm straight through both pieces so that it goes exactly straight across those, just like a, a railroad crossing a road. And I'm gonna pull that thread through and I'm gonna pull it all the way through until I have about a quarter of an inch tail, half of an inch tail. And I'm gonna hold that tail down so that I can pull that thread and it doesn't escape. Now I'm gonna go back through the same place, just catching a couple threads and again, I'm parallel like a train track going across a road. And I have now, I have a thread in front that's the tail from where I went in before. And I have the rest of my thread in the back. And so what I'm gonna do is take this thread that's in front and bring it to the back. And I'm gonna take the thread that's at the back and wrap it around the needle. And then still holding that tail, I'm gonna pull that thread through. And now that's made an absolutely tight knot. You cannot see it. It's not there <laughs> other than it's tighter than tight. And every time I get to a point on a hexagon, I'm gonna do that knicker knot or knotty knot. I call it a knotty knot. And then I do have a little bit of a tail hanging down from what I was holding. So I'm gonna snip that off and I can take, I can take it pretty tight and that tail's gone. So now I don't have any hanging down threads. And now to sew this, I'm gonna continue with that, just grabbing a couple stitches and a couple stitches from each side. I mean, I'm just barely catching the fabric and go exactly perpendicular and stitch. Now, because this isn't any longer than my tip of my finger to about my elbow, I'm not making these big long swoops and it doesn't get caught. I'm gonna go back in again. And, and let me show you something I didn't even realize I did till I started doing this. So I pull that through and when I pull it through, I take this finger and I go up and I catch that thread and pull it down. So now it's not in my way when I get ready to make my next stitch. And I catch each little thread of fabric. I pull through, bring my finger down, pull that thread down, and now I'm clear to do my stitching. And I'm doing this from the back side, and it's kind of weird because I'm trying to show you, but there you go. And I'm gonna do that whole edge all the way across. So let me do that real quick. This is where you can go to the bathroom or get a drink of water or, no, this will just take me a minute. 
and I didn't pull it down, so I got a little knot there, but it's okay. We're going to keep going. So I'm going to just stitch across here. And this actually goes really pretty fast. I've gotten to where I, gosh, I don't know how many of these I can do in a night, but it's it's gotten pretty quick um, how fast I can stitch. But because when I glued it, I left a little gap there. There's The fabric isn't attached kind of at the top edge, and it allows me to have a little kind of like a bubble of fabric there I can grab. Now, you don't want to go through the, um, I unthreaded my needle, isn't this fine? Um, you don't want to go through the paper. You want to stay out of the paper. Oh yeah, watch me doing this. Oh, I did it first thing. Dang, that's unusual. Okay, um, you don't want to go through the paper. You, you're going to touch the paper. You're going to feel the thread kind of catching the paper. And that's to be expected, but it's but it shouldn't go through the paper. Now, if you do go through the paper, it's not a problem. I can I can tell you it, it comes right out. Thread stronger than you think, um, and uh, it it just pulls out when you take the papers out. Papers come out very easily, by the way. I'm going to show you that in a minute too. Okay, so now I'm to my point, and I'm going to do my knicker knot again. So I'm gonna pull the thread through and I'm gonna pull it through again. And so now, because I've made some stitches, both, both threads are at the back of the, of the pattern, or back of the hexagon. So I'm gonna bring, there's two threads. There's the one that's coming right out of the fabric and there's the one that's through the eye of the needle. So I'm gonna take and go around the needle to one way and take the other thread and go around the needle the other way. So I've just basically looped that thread around that needle. And now I'm going to pull that through, and now I have my knicker knot again, okay? So, I'm ready to open her up. I have my first piece sewn on, and hopefully my stitches are fairly invisible, which they mostly are. They mostly are. And now I'm going to put my next piece on, and I'm going to watch and make sure, because this one has a pattern, that I put it on the same way, okay? And like I say, these didn't work out the greatest. So, I'm ready to sew this one on. So I fold them two together, make sure I know which side's the right side to sew, put my magnets on. Now my thread is still in there, but I'm still gonna kinda make sure these sides match. And if I have to, you know, squeeze it a little bit one way or the other, but I want this point and this point to be exactly in the same place. And I go again through one side, through the next side. I'm gonna do my little knot so I have the thread that's through the fabric, I'm gonna bring around this way. The thread that's coming through the eye of the needle, I'm gonna come around the opposite way. And I'm gonna pull that thread through. And I've made a knot on that corner. Now, that knot, there's a knot here, there's a knot, there's a knot on both corners. That's really important, especially now that I have to rip this one out. I know there's a knot, there's four knots. There's a knot on this one, this one, this one, this one. I can rip this one off and not worry about these two coming unstitched. That's another reason to do that nick or not. So I'm gonna sew across there, and I'm not gonna have you suffer through watching me sew that, but I'm gonna sew that across there again. And then at that point, see how these are all hanging loose? I'm, I'm gonna sew all these all the way around. And well, let me do this one real quick, just so you can see. Well, that's all right. Let's do, let's do this next. So I'm gonna glue, so I, this is, I'm gonna be ready now, I'm gonna put this aside. So I've sewn all of these on, and I have to sew the bottom, because when you look at this, it's the six hexagons, the one on the top and the one on the bottom to make my pin cushion. So I'm gonna glue this piece real quick, so you see the bottom. Now, I'm getting ready to put the pin cushion together. I sew all these pieces around the center. What? There, okay. And I have my top and my bottom. And what I like to do, I'm gonna sew this piece on, is I'm gonna sew a piece here. So that when I sew this together, this is what it looks like before I make my pin cushion. So you know what, let's just use this because we can. 
This will give you the idea. It's a different pattern, but it's okay. Okay, so we'll just pretend that's it. All right, I wanna sew all six of these on so that they're loose like this, okay? They're not sewn down the sides yet. And then this is my bottom. That's what your pin cushion is gonna look like before you sew it together. So let me sew this piece on real quick. So you can see, a little sewing time. We're actually having a big snowstorm in Indiana right now, so that's why we're at home doing this video instead of at the shop. So my husband's getting to be the videographer. Oh, you know what I didn't talk about, I can talk about right now, is I have a little, so a pen, a thimble is gonna become important to you. <laughs> you'll get your finger, you'll find your finger, whichever finger you push with gets tired. I like this little dot, it's called a thimble it, I think, um, because I can just stick it right on the finger that I push with. Um, if I put a thimble on my finger, my finger doesn't get used, it's wackadoo. So I like this little glue, it comes with these little pads, they're little adhesive pads. You stick it on the back of that thing and stick that on your finger and I love it. It's like my favorite thimble. Um, but, but you gotta get what works for you. Okay, so here we go again. I'm gonna pull this through. I'm gonna do my knicker knot like this. I might just leave this funny little one like this. It'll have some weird characteristics. So you see I went around left and right and I pull that through and now she's good and tight. All right, here we go again. Speed stitching. And the other thing is, you know, for instance, if I was going this direction and it's easier for me to go that direction, I can come back and sew the other way. You can turn these any which way you need to, to, to that feels comfortable for your hand. I've heard some people don't wanna push the needle toward them, they wanna pull the needle away from them. Okay, do what works for your hand. I have carpal tunnel in my hands and I have to be careful when I do things that are repetitive that I do them in such a way that doesn't irritate that situation. So um, for me, sewing in this direction works. You may have a grandmother or somebody who said, oh, you absolutely positively always have to. And I hate always and never statements because I feel like, you know, when we're creating um, things with our fiber and our, and our thread and things, this is art. And at the end of the day, it's, it's as beautiful as you think it is. It's, and there's, there are techniques you need to learn you know, how to do things correctly. And that's all good and well, but at the end of the day, the reason we do these projects is to bring us joy and happiness. And if you get so tangled up in doing it the right way, instead of what works for you, then sometimes we forget the joy and happiness in what we're doing. And I think that's, that's sad. So just remember, don't quilt shame other people if they don't do it exactly perfect. You know, if they want to learn the technique, give them the chance, but but let's not beat people up when they don't do it exactly right. Okay, so now I have all my pieces sewn on around my hexagon. They're just flapping. And in order to make this work, what we're gonna to have to do now is start sewing the sides together. So what I want you to do is realize you can fold that center piece, no problem. And now I'm gonna match this side. So I have to sew all these sides, and I actually I'm gonna sew down that side too. So my thread's already in there at that point. I'm gonna take my magnet. I'm gonna, again, make sure I have the right sides together. It's another good reason to use the magnet. I try to always put my magnet parallel to the side I'm sewing to help me keep track of where I'm going. And now I'm gonna sew this side. So this is how we get up to the sides. To, to close this, this thing up so that we can fill it with the, with the walnut shells. So here she goes. We're gonna go all the way up. Never thought you'd sit and watch somebody stab. You know, I will say for stitchers to be able to stab something thousands of times, it is a great way to get rid of your frustration. <laughs> You just keep stabbing things, man. Give me a needle and let me stab it. Um, we've certainly been through a lot the last two or three years, and and to be able to do something that gives you peace and tranquility. This this is part of what's called the slow stitching movement. I think 
we've been able to do things so quickly that sometimes we forget that the joy is in the journey and that the, the point of making something is the ability to just um, sit back, take your time, not be in a hurry. Okay, I'm gonna do another knicker knot. I'm gonna show you how to do that. So I'm through the fabric. I'm taking the one closest to the fabric around one side, taking the one in the eye of the needle around the other side and pulling that through. That knicker knot gets people. Okay, so now when you look at the top of this, I've sewn here and here and I've done one side. Now I'm gonna sew this side. Okay, so see which side that is? That's that side right there. So I'm gonna sew that together. And I'm gonna start with my knicker knot around the left. I go around the right and pull it through. It's a hard thing to do to kind of get your head around how that works, but I'm just going to tell you, I use it all the time now. I, I don't ever start a stitch by tying a knot in the end of my thread. I just do a knicker knot, and, and then it stays, and it uses less thread. It, um, it's secure. It's very secure. I'm just very pleased with that. It's a very cool. It's, a, it's an old garment knot, I guess, and I started out as a garment gal but didn't even know it existed, so... Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can make comments under our YouTube. Please do that. Um, also, our website is www.alwaysinstitches1.com. Just about anything you want to know about the stores there. You can shop there. You can um, find out what our hours are. You can look for classes. Uh, we always have charitable projects going. You can find the charitable projects on there. I'm filling time while I sew, can you tell? <laughs> trying to keep you from getting bored. Okay, so now I'm down that side and I want you to see how this goes together now. This, this'll this be enough, I think you'll be able to get it from here. I'm doing my knicker knot on the corners even though I'm sewing fast here. Okay. Now, so now I have sewn, see these two sides, I've gone basically up here and here and sewn that together. I'm gonna to do the same thing here. I'm gonna sew this like that all the way around so that when I sew this, and I'm gonna leave those papers in, and I can fold the daylights out of those papers and they don't care. So what I'm gonna have is this. And you can actually, if you wanna fold this to kind of get this shape so that you can keep track of where you're supposed to be, that's what I'm gonna to sew together. So you see how that's been opened? Okay, and there's my bottom, and then these are all going to sew together. So I'm going to sew here and across, and here and across, and here and across. And so the easiest way to do this, I've learned, is to go up and over and across. So I'm, that's the next one I'm going to do. And then I'm going to go down this way, and then I'm probably going to have to cut my thread, and I'm going to come back up here. So there's times you're going to have to stop and start your thread but I like to try and make it as far as I can and go around the bottom hexagon. But you're gonna leave one hexagon corner open. And the reason I leave that open is I gotta put this stuff in there. So this will just pour in. Um, you'll turn this inside out, take all your papers out, turn it inside out, and then it'll look like this. And then you can see right here this was my last seam that I sewed. I happened to put a ribbon in there to hold things, but that's my last seam. I just leave that seam open so I can pour my stuffing in, and then I sew that last seam together, and it gives me my pin cushion. So this is where we are here. Finish sewing all those seams. Take all your papers out. Turn it inside out through the one little hole that you left open. Turn it inside out so that you're, no, turn it right side out. <laughs> Not inside out, turn it right side out. And you leave that one little hole and then you end up with this. With or without the ribbon. I have ribbons usually from, like this came off of a fat quarter bundle. So I would take that piece and probably sew that in there too. Or this is just some grow grain ribbon. Just, just because I like to have something, when it sits on my cutting table, this kind of hangs down over the edge and it gives me a place to put my binder clips. 
but you know, you don't have to. You could make it out of fabric. You could do whatever you want. Um, but you go from this, wrong side out, sew all those seams, take out your papers, turn it inside out, fill it, and sew that together. And then that makes it. So if you have questions, which you may or may not, if you do, great. If not, um, you can always call the um, shop 317-776-4227, and we'll try and answer your questions. You can email me. It's Cappy, so it's like C-A-P-I, like the letter I, C-A-P-I, like a baseball cap with the letter I on the end, Cappy at alwaysinstitches1.com. That's my email address. And hopefully you end up with some really cute pen cushions. These also make great um, pattern weights. So um, you can make a bunch of these and just use them when you're sewing to lay down on stuff to hold things in place. So they're, they're really kind of a versatile little thing. Great introduction to English paper piecing. If you've enjoyed this and want to do more, I have a series called um, Tula Nova. There's like three or four videos. That was a result of this particular quilt um, that I made. So if you want to get more into English paper piecing like that, I also would suggest Sue Daly's videos, and Tula Pink does some nice English paper piecing information too. So hopefully you get on this journey of slow stitching, you enjoy it. At the very least, you have a really cute pin cushion out of the deal if you don't make anything else. So thanks for watching and happy stitching.